This evening, I'd like to sort of jump the gun on some work we are doing uh, with these Tibetan prints, which I am now studying, because I think they have a bearing on the subject of the evening. Uh, in the Kala Chakra school of northern yogic doctrine, uh, the heart is represented as what is called the small lotus. It is not the principal chakra of the uh, heart or cardiac area, but a small flower of eight petals concealed within the very center of the heart focus itself. Now, of course, the lotus with eight petals has become so uh, in intimately associated with Buddhism that we have only to recall that nearly always the deities of the northern school especially are represented as seated or standing upon lotus blossoms. This eight-spoked or eight-petaled lotus of the heart is, of course, also reminiscent of the, of the noble eightfold path or the mysterious wheel of eight spokes. And we know that in Buddhism, the number of the petals on the symbolic lotus is arranged to conform with the eight spokes of the wheel. Now all this centers in what the Northern School itself refers to as the heart doctrine. And this doctrine is in strong distinction to the highly mentalistic system of Southern Buddhism. Our principal purpose, however, in bringing this uh, out at this moment is a peculiar symbolism uh, which is found in both China and Japan. There is a belief in the religions of, that, of those uh, areas, a faith which is quite clearly indicated in the Shingong and the Nichiren sects in Japan and the White Lotus sect of China. It is the belief of these people that when a devout person, or in fact any person, but especially a devout one, approaches death, that a mysterious vision appears. This is a classic vision in Oriental art. Uh, because the term is easier in Japanese uh, religion than in Chinese, where the words are utterly unfamiliar to us, Perhaps it is best to use the Japanese terms. The dying person is said to receive a vision in which the uh, Buddha Amida or Amitabha appears upon clouds accompanied by two bodhisattvas, one on each side. On the left of Amida, is the Bodhisattva Kanan, Chinese Kuan Yin. And this Bodhisattva always carries what is called the lotus pedestal. This is an empty throne in the form of an open lotus, and it is brought to receive the soul of the dead. The deceased person, the moment the transition from this world to the next is complete, is found in or seated upon this lotus pedestal. If the soul is that of a person uh, of no solid spiritual attainment, it is said that as soon as the soul is seated there, the petals of the lotus close around it so that it is concealed as in the heart of the lotus, as in a kind of lotus womb. In this bud-shaped form, it is transported to the Western Paradise. 
Now, if this person, regardless of his virtues or his vices, has at any time recited the great formula, Namu Amida Butsu, Hail to Amida Buddha, with contrition of spirit and sincerity of heart, and has acknowledged, even though he has disobeyed, the sovereignty of the law, has acknowledged in his heart that there is truth. This soul, then, is carried in the bud into the other world where it passes through a second birth. And as its interior consciousness grows, the petals again open, and the soul is permitted to dwell in the world of Amitabha. If, however, the dying person is of advanced spiritual attainment or of greater integrity, then the soul is represented as seated in a Buddha-like posture in the open lotus as it is carried across to the other shore of the mysterious ocean of life. Now this scene is very, very common in Eastern art. And I think perhaps it is sufficiently interesting inasmuch as the old teaching both of yoga and of tantra, of the old Brahmanical lore upon which so much early Buddhism was based, makes a great point of this eight-petaled lotus throne. And it states uh, that this throne represents the heart of the person. Studying the triad appearing in the clouds, as in the vision already mentioned, uh, the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, or Kan Nan, who carries the pedestal, is always upon the left side of the central deity. And we may also remember, therefore, that it is a left branch of the pneumogastric nerve which touches the pacemaker in the heart as a nerve and also by ascent reaches the brain. This peculiar point may cause us to suspect that the so-called vision is actually a study of the central nervous system with its sympathetic cords, and that Amida represents in this sense the mysterious primordial consciousness which is seated in the heart of the small lotus in the heart, and that this throne by which the soul is carried to the other world corresponds with the Brahmanic belief that at death the consciousness is gradually withdrawn from the circumference of the body and is focused or brought together in the apex of the left ventricle of the heart, where it then ascends by means of the left branch of the vagus or pneumogastric nerve to the brain and finally departs from the body through what is called the gate of Brahma or the thousand petal lotus at the crown of the head. If we can assume a, an analogy here, I think it is a very interesting one, because it gives us another dimension to this old symbolism, implying, as the Shingon has always implied in Japan, that all ritual, symbol, allegory, legend, and fable had to do with the motion of the principal spiritual, psychic, and energy currents of the human body. As far back as our studies in philosophy are able to go, as far back as man has left a record of his convictions and his beliefs, the human heart has been peculiarly sacred. We have to realize that in olden times, dissection was unknown. 
and in most civilized nations, autopsy was not permitted. It was therefore not upon a study of the heart as an organ uh, that ancient knowledge was derived. It was rather derived from a series of observational factors, perhaps supported by a strong intuitional realization that certain processes depended upon certain structure or function for their existence. And gradually, ancient man, without benefit of modern scientific thinking, came to remarkably accurate conclusions uh, concerning the inner structure of his own body. Uh, these conclusions were perhaps not entirely sympathetic with modern anatomy and physiology, but in many respects they were not wrong. In most respects they were not wrong. And in some cases and under some circumstances, uh, they advanced in ancient time conviction or belief, which even today we have not yet been able to either prove or disprove, because much of their thinking was exceedingly profound in these areas. Among ancient peoples, the heart was symbolized in a number of ways. Uh, in northern Buddhism, it is usually represented by a vase, a very elaborate structure. Not the slender, tapering, bottle-shaped vase of Kuan Yin, which contained the waters of immortality, but a very elaborate uh, Chinese-Tibetan type of urn, often represented in the lap of Amitabha as he sits in meditation. In the mandalas and meditating wheels, this vase is always the dead center of the circle, which in itself is a rather interesting concept. Everything radiates from this central focus. This vase, according to the belief of the ancient peoples, contained the mysterious, subtle energy of space itself. It was not merely a medicine for the woes of mankind. It was the mysterious fountain from which flowed all life, light, and reality. The Egyptians came very close to the same symbolism, for in their uh, manuscripts, particularly the papyri relating to the mortuary ceremonies, the heart is represented as a kind of jar, sometimes with a handle, sometimes without, but nearly always ornamented upon one side by design symbolizing a human ear. Uh, this peculiar vase is placed on the balance of the scale in the weighing of the soul or the weighing of conscience in the Hall of the Twin Truths. It is this vase that speaks. This jar describes itself as containing the soul of the deceased. In uh, many other religious symbols and systems, uh, this central mystery is called a cavern or a place hidden. In the New Testament, it is referred to as a closet into which the man shall go to pray to his father in secret. And the father who hears him in secret will reward him openly. This is the dark closet, the mysterious place. This is Porphyry's cave of the nymphs in the Neoplatonic system of thought. This is Zoroaster's mysterious cavern. And it is the Septapana cavern of Buddha or the cave of seven rooms in which the initiations into the mysteries of Buddhism were given to the candidates or neophytes. Uh, Hermes describes the heart as a pyramid, and in a strange way it is a kind of inverted one. There seems much to suggest that in Egyptian philosophy the symbolism of the pyramid was intended to represent the structure of the heart. 
Adams, in his book, The House of the Hidden Places, devoted to a study of the pyramids, strongly advances this thinking. The heart, then, has become associated gradually with the concept of the heart of a people, the heart of a community, the heart of a civilization, whatever may be regarded as the focal point, the central point, the strong point around which all other things are built. Uh, this seems to suggest the idea of the heart. If you have visited the countless cathedral towns and villages of Europe, you will see the little cluster of buildings, the town, surrounding the soaring heights of the church or the cathedral. For these people, the church was the heart of the community. And wherever the ecclesia appears, in relationship to the congregation, it is the heart. Entering into the church is entering into the heart, symbolically. The heart represents, therefore, the cultural center, the life center, and is associated with all of the essential functions of a people. In our way of life, the same is essentially true, but by our various attitudes, we place different structures in the center of our ways of life to indicate our essential sense of value. To some persons, the home is his heart. To others, business <coughs> may be the heart. But that which is most cherished, held to be most dear or most valuable, or regarded as the source of the inspiration to good or achievement, or as a symbol of final security against all the problems and mysteries of life. This type of concept is associated with the heart idea. Also, we know that to the Chinese and other Asiatic peoples, certain beliefs were the heart of the matter. Certain doctrines were regarded as more essential than others. And where a certain scriptural book or a certain commentary was more important than any other, it was referred to as the heart book or the heart symbol. The Egyptians, in mummifying their dead, removed certain vital organs from the body before mummification, and, in, and variously mummified them separately in jars, which were placed under the couch of death. The heart, however, was not removed. The heart, therefore, seemed to represent a kind of tabernacle. It was something too sacred to be taken. In uh, the ancient astral theology of many peoples, the heart became a sun or solar system symbol. It was consequent to assume that what the heart is to man, the sun is to the world. Therefore, as the sun became the radiant center which supported the planets and all the life upon them, so the heart was the radiant center that supplied the life and energy of the body. The analogies can go on almost indefinitely, but they are not our primary purpose, so that I think perhaps we can assume you will read the section and find more of them for yourself. The next point that I think is very significant to us is the fact that the heart is actually only a muscle. The heart in itself can no longer, be, no more bestow life than the brain can bestow thought. Just as the brain is merely a structure, so the heart is merely one of the vital organs of the body, the most vital. Yet in itself, we cannot assume or regard it as the source of the fact of aliveness. Of the heart, a certain point is particularly associated 
Uh, it is called the pacemaker. And apparently is that area in the heart which is the origin of the pulse. And it is this pulsing of the heart that some mysteriously, mysterious and wonderful way seems to preserve the fact that we are alive. If this pulsation ceases, life ceases. In India, this pulsation is called the drumbeat of Shiva. And in China, the study of the pulse, the study of the heartbeat, was carried to an extraordinary degree, further perhaps than it has ever been actually researched in the West. More and more, however, we are coming to the Chinese point of view. Paracelsus had come to it centuries ago. And this point of view is that the heart beat is again not merely a mechanical process. It is not simply that it beats or that it stops beating. The very process of the heart beat itself is a highly specialized and very complicated process, even in terms of phenomena. What its cause is, is not the mo at the moment our consideration with the Chinese doctor. Our present consideration is the story that it tells. The Chinese have found, and other specialists have more or less sustained this, that the beat of the heart uh, differs not only with every person to some degree, but differs continuously within any one person. The heartbeat is an exceedingly important means of diagnosis in cases of sickness. The Chinese are able to identify over 300 ailments merely from the pulse. The patient can put a glove on his hand and put his hand through a hole in a curtain so that the physician can never see the patient or even the hand. And the physician, by placing his three fingers upon the pulse in different positions, will be able to diagnose over 300 probable complaints and determine which one or group of complaints is most likely afflicting the patient. The system must have been reasonably accurate because we remember that in China a physician is only paid while the patient is well. If for any reason the patient becomes ill, payment stops. And it is then the duty of the doctor to hasten the recovery for the sake of his own financial status. This uh, diagnosis by the pulse, however, was in China associated largely with physical complaints, although worry, fear, and things of that nature might also be diagnosed. Today in the Western world, through a series of um, scientific processes, such as the electrocardiograph and the polygraph, uh, the study of the heart has been given very great uh, psychological um, consideration. We now know that every mood, every emotion, every attitude, every circumstance which affects the individual can and very often does affect the heart. That the heart is extremely sensitive. That it is just as sensitive to emotional problems as to physical problems. The Chinese have a circuitous way of approaching this, but perhaps they are not entirely wrong that every physical ailment produces some kind of a psychological ailment, and that every psychological attitude will ultimately set up a series of physical circumstances. Therefore, perhaps the Chinese physician is diagnosing not the physical circumstances alone, but the psychological reflexes of these circumstances, which in their turn 
do modify the pulse rate as we know. It is quite easy on a polygraph to detect from the heart when a man tells a lie. In other words, his heart doesn't accept the lie. His heart reveals the truth of the matter, his fears, his anxieties. The heart will frequently reveal guilt because of the agitation which arises when the mind is brought into proximity with related ideas and the person who has committed the crime begins to fear that he is being trapped into an exposure. The moment the fear comes, the polygraph detects this in the cardiac action. Thus the heart is an extremely subtle instrument. And the mere beating of it is not its whole story. Now the heart as a muscle must have some very close tie-in with other areas of nerve reflex in order to be so immediately hypersensitive, even beyond the consciousness of the mind itself. The heart apparently is much more oriented in a realm of subconscious pressures, subconscious instincts and not entirely on the level of mere conscious attitudes. This brings a very definite point uh, which the Greeks began to explore, but their civilization gradually vanished away before their sciences were perfected in these matters. But later others took up this line of thought, and it is still a rather debatable issue. Does the pulse, this mysterious drumming of the gods, actually originate in the heart? Or is it communicated to the heart? Is the so-called beating of the heart something innate and intrinsic in this muscle? Or has it another cause? And is the circulation of the blood due to the action of the heart? Or is the action of the heart due to the circulation of the blood? Now this would present uh, a series of problems that uh, could easily become very confused and probably would be regarded with the gravest suspicion by men of science. Yet the fact remains that it is not at all inconceivable that the heart is what it has always been believed to be in the worlds of religion and philosophy, not a source of the vitalizing or activation of the body, but a focal point for energy of a peculiar and particular kind, which is in some way imparted to the heart and therefore is capable of being separated from the heart by the process of death. Is the death of the body a death of energy or a separation of energy, as in the case of thinking, where we are not at all certain that the death of the brain means inevitably the death of the intellect? Let us suppose for a moment that we recognize man not merely as a physical body as we see it, but as more accurately and more factually a kind of magnetic field. That man is really a physical body floating in a sea of magnetic energy that this magnetic energy forms what has been termed the invisible or intangible perspiration, or perhaps may be likened to the mysterious bottle of alchemy, the retort of crystal, in which the processes of transmutation, generation, regeneration, and transformation 
take place. It is, it was long held and is still believed in Asia that consciousness per se as itself is not located in the body but that more correctly and properly the body is located within the consciousness. That consciousness, consciousness is not a point but an area. This uh, problem also confronts the student of astronomy. The question as to whether the sun is the source of its own energy. Ancient peoples did not believe that it was. They believed that what we call the solar disk is actually a shield carried on the arm of the sun god, by means of which this deity reflects invisible energy into the visible world. In the Japanese creation myth, the solar deity is feminine, the goddess of the sun, and with her is immediately associated the metal mirror of Shinto, for she is said to reflect the light of heaven upon the face of a mirror, and this mirror is the sun. The ancients used various kinds of glasses, lenses, and mirrors to collect light for the lighting of altar fires. And they took the attitude that the uh, pacemaker, or the pulse center, or the heat center in the heart, is such a convergence of rays, and that the source of this life is not in the heart, but is imparted to it from this magnetic field. This magnetic field itself is in constant motion. This motion includes not only movements of currents and eddies within the field itself, but the primary vibration of the basic substance or minute particles from which magnetic energy is formed. Thus what we call the pulse beat is really the beat of the magnetic field itself, communicated to the body. And this magnetic field is in a constant process of motion, vibratory motion, which corresponds to the beat of the heart. Thus the heart would become a kind of island in the center of a magnetic field. In the very early stages of the development of the embryo, uh, the so-called mysterious agent of blood is not clearly differentiated. But ultimately blood becomes the vehicle of energy. And the arterial venous system extends not only to the surface of the body, but extends as magnetic fields out beyond the body. Thus the blood and the magnetic field are associated. And it is possible that the blood is the means or medium by which the magnetic essence is conveyed to the heart. However we wish to look at this problem, the question naturally arises as to whether the heart is the source of its own energy or whether this energy is imparted. And I believe that most thoughtful persons from the beginning of recorded research have held it to be essentially firm that this energy is not intrinsic in the heart itself but is imparted. The great mystics of the early medieval period who were among some of the most powerful visionaries that we have ever produced, had various uh, descriptions of experiences which they saw a function of body and organ. I'm thinking of St. Hildegard of Bingen, one of the most uh, important and interesting of the uh, Catholic religious mystics. 
St. Hildegard left manuscripts illuminated with numberless figures and designs of things that she had seen as inner experiences. And these touch upon the problem of the heart. And her concept of it was very definitely that it was a kind of solar center which was sustained continuously from its own field and that therefore the field was the important thing, not the organ itself. She also held that the consciousness in its relationship to the heart was subject to a special kind of interpretation. If it is true, as the ancients also held, and we find in Indian Vedic tradition and lore, that the three persons of the great creative trinity are represented by the heart, the brain, and the reproductive focus, then this trinity would consist of consciousness as the heart or central power, intelligence as the brain focus and force, vitality, or energy as the negative focus. These would therefore constitute a basic triad. Buddhism, particularly in Japan and China, began the study of what they called the Lotus Gospel. And this was the gospel of the mystery of the heart, which they finally came to recognize as probably the most important of all the mysterious sciences which man could discover, the science of the true meaning of the heart. Now we think of religion almost always as a heart doctrine, but we think of it largely as a mystical emotional doctrine. We think of the individual's heart being the source of a kind of goodness that it is the source of a basic morality, that it is the substance of the truth in him, and that in this sense of the word, his heart means that he is possessed by a certain charity. The heart is associated with love, charitas. It is associated with all types of human affection. But to these students in the olden days, much more was implied than this. They held definitely that the focal point which we call consciousness was actually placed in the heart. That in a mysterious way, the structure of the heart provided it with a primary brain of its own. Therefore, that there are two kinds of brains, the mental brain and the heart brain. That the mental brain is the source of intellection. The heart brain is the source of mystical or visionary apperception. That man might achieve knowledge through the brain, but truth only through the heart that these are different types of structures. So we find also in the old writings the reference to the fact that there are seven brains in the heart and seven hearts in the brain. That in a strange way, the heart, as shown in the old Rosicrucian diagrams, becomes a symbol of the solar system, with the sun placed centrally surrounded by the orbits of the planets which are found in the structure of the heart itself and the entire wall of the heart as in the pictures by Bemi, surrounded by and composed of the constellations of the zodiac. Thus the heart is a universe within man. It has the potential of supplying the entire external structure the body from itself, because it has received into its own nature the essential seed of life, and that this seed of life therefore becomes the base of the livingness 
of the body uh, which uh, develops around the heart is supported by it and in turn the body becomes the protector and administrator of the heart power. What then would be the nature of the consciousness in the heart? Hermes, in his discourse to his son Tatian, attempts to clarify this point, but probably lived a little too soon to have some of the interesting scientific facts at his disposal. Also, uh, too soon for much of the digestion of philosophy, particularly oriental thinking, which has more recently come to our awareness. Consciousness is not to be associated with thought process. Consciousness in its own nature, therefore, is not to be penetrated. It is not to be analyzed or examined. It is merely a superior state of awareness, an awareness which seemingly still remains directed primarily toward cause and not toward effect. Therefore, the heart seems to be more aware of things invisible behind itself than of things visible in front of itself. The, the heart contribution, therefore, is not intellectual, rational, or reasonable in the sense of mental activity. The heart contribution is most expressed and most clearly sensed in the mysterious uh, potential of reality that is lurking within our own natures. The scriptures suggest that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And this thinking in the heart is not conscious thinking. This thinking in the heart is God thinking man, not man thinking about God. This is spirit mysteriously manifesting through its works, and these works themselves are not capable of comprehending their own Lord and Master. So that when man enters into the heart, he enters into silence. He enters into the great quietude of Lao Tse. He enters into that silence that came before the sounding, as Bemi calls it, and that silence into which the sounding must finally return again to sleep. Thus, whatever this mysterious power that resides in the heart may be, its primary requisite is quietude. It would and must abide in peace. And the principal experience we have of the heart is the capacity for peace uh, which comes to us. The capacity to have so great an interior sense of reality that without intellection, without argument, without debate, without affirmation or denial, the being experiences the fact of the presence of reality. It is this experience of reality, then, this experience of not only of an existence, but an eternal and significant existence. This experience comes to man. Man then takes hold of it and intellectualizes it. But the experience, the essential conviction comes first. And this conviction is not thought. It is known by a mysterious experience within the self. Of this, then, we can say in terms of the definition of consciousness, that in some mysterious way it is the invisible source of this sense of beingness, this sense of significant purposed existence, which all things feel within themselves. 
The loss of this feeling through any circumstance or affliction or despondency of the emotions or mind can result in what is termed the broken heart. This can exist. It is a term, however, which simply represents the loss of this sense of heart value, the loss of the, of the spirit of meaningful life within the experience of the person. Actually, uh, to put any of this type of thinking into any kind of wording is extremely awkward. So we can only, so to say, talk around it and hope that you will catch the point which I am trying to make. Namely, that the consciousness in man contributes no ideas, no news, nothing of a tangible intellectual nature. It merely contributes this sense that we exist, this I amness of ourselves, not voiced, not rationalized, but assumed, so near to us that we do not doubt it, question it, or analyze it, but turn from it to doubt, question, and analyze all other things. It is perhaps experienced somewhat in this concept that man is incapable of the experience of death. He is, un he is unable to know what death means because he is alive. And it is a series of certainties based upon the fact that we are alive that must be basically associated with the heart system. Now the moment this system comes into existence, man begins the elaborate process of transforming it. Uh, in the uh, Kala Chakra concept, therefore, we remember, as I said, that there is the large chakra located, or the, uh, that is the ganglia of the autonomic nervous system, located in approximately the heart region. Then there is within this the small lotus or the small flower of eight petals. The outer flower, the chakra, is very largely the center of man's sensational existence. It is here that the individual passes into the expression of the entire gamut of his emotional propensities. Thus there are, we may say, at least two layers to the heart consciousness, its own innate structure, which remains forever in a state of reality, and its emotional negative polarity, which extends outward into the sphere of the sensory perceptions and reflexes. Therefore, the innerness of the heart may say, I know. The outer part of the heart may say, I choose to believe. Then the mind comes along and says, well, it's my opinion. And everybody has been heard from in some way or in some degree. There can be no doubt that the mind is essentially under the control of the heart. That the mind, therefore, is a subordinate being. Uh, the heart will retain function longer than the brain if the two are separated in any way. Uh, the brain's consciousness ceases very quickly, but it is well recorded that the human heart has survived uh, a assumed death for a, an hour or even longer, and that it is quite possible to demonstrate that the heart tissue of serpents, after the heart has been chopped into small parts, the various small parts will continue to show a certain amount of pulsation. 
Therefore, we are dealing not merely with a structure, but we are dealing with a kind of pull for energy which itself is pulsing. And it is the pulsation of energy that is communicated to the heart as a muscle. In this sense also, the psychic life of man is very closely associated with the outer or large chakra of the heart system. Uh, our emotions very largely cause our psychic stress, and the mental reaction or factor is secondary. Where, and almost always where you find the mind disordered, the emotions were disordered first. And the, motion, uh, the emotions, by some ill training which was given to them, gradually dragged down the mind. This is true uh, also in terms of the affections of man. Uh, the psychic field with which we are very largely concerned today is therefore an elaborate structure of symbolic reflexes based upon consciousness, even as the mental field is a series of reflexes based upon the released energies of mentation. And uh, we cannot assume that these various degrees of manifestation are identical. They are emanational one from the other. The lower always being lesser in, val in value or quality. Now let us go back directly to the heart problem which we have very definitely to consider. The ancients regarded the heart as being a kind of seed. Uh, this seed, of course, has growing from it a great tree, this tree being the arterial venous system. So if you lay this out diagrammatically or make a drawing of this structure of the arterial system, rising from the major arteries, in turn rising from the heart. You come to a design that is almost exactly the design of a plant. It has a bulb-like root, which is in some kind of earth. And this plant unfolds, extending throughout the body, where it controls life function. At the same time, we have another tree. This principal tree also grows from a seed or a bulb or a root. In this case, the brain. This is the nervous system. And when laid out diagrammatically, is exactly the equivalent of the arterial system in design, or so similar that there need to be very little adjustment made. Thus the brain becomes the seed of the nervous system and the heart becomes the seed of the arterial system. Back in the days when somebody was compiling Genesis, it came apparently to their attention that man in some way had these two trees. Therefore, one was called the tree of life, and this tree of life grew from the heart. And the other was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and this grew from the brain, which was perfectly consistent, reasonable, and proper. Now, in the course of time, uh, certain things happened in the Garden of Eden which uh, are a scandal to us even yet. So there's no use to bring up this delicate issue. But the fact remains that man uh, was cast out of the Garden in connection with breaking the will of Deity concerning the fruit growing upon these trees. And if we think a little about this, we can do some rather interesting rationalization. 
Bailey, the mystic, declared also that there was another tree. And this he symbolized by the peculiar symbol of the palm tree. And we know that the palm leaf uh, is one of the, uh, the ancient symbols of martyrdom and uh, was also important in connection with Palm Sunday and things relating to Christianity. The palm leaf or the palm tree was the tree of rest in the desert. The palm tree, wherever it appeared, told the wandering nomad of the desert that water had to be there. And while the water might be underground, there was also a limit to the root of the palm tree could go. And usually the palm marked the oasis. Also, the shade of the palm might be the only protection against the desert sun. The palm tree in Christian symbolism, because Christianity arose in a desert region where the palm was one of the great symbols of hope and rest and salvation became a very adequate symbol for the soul. And in, the, uh, in Bailey's writings, uh, the symbol or significance of Christ is clearly pointed that the seed of Christ is planted in the human heart where it grows up into a great palm tree. And this palm tree was the symbol of the promise or the symbol of the waters of life, the symbol of salvation in the desert of waiting, the symbol of the promise of peace to those who were suffering from the storms and privation of the great wastes of sand. Therefore, to Bailey, uh, salvation, or the soul, was a third tree and the soul grew from the heart. And the soul grew from the heart rather than from the brain. Therefore, the redemption of man lies in the redemption of the heart motives rather than in the, uh, shall we say, uh, conversion of the brain to certain attitudes. Uh, this is the point that was made in the... Uh, Buddhist system, where uh, the soul was taken to paradise if once during life it had truly, sincerely, and devoutly accepted the mystery of truth. Now, in this system also, there is an interesting thing, because somewhere in space is the great lake of paradise. And in Asia, this lake of paradise is a wonderful pond, very peaceful and beautiful. And the surface of it is covered with lotus flowers. And every time a human being performs a beautiful act, a new bud is born there. And that is the bud that will later be brought to him as the throne to carry his soul to paradise. In other words, it is his own good deed that becomes the throne or the lotus blossom which is brought to him when the time comes for his soul to make the transition. So for every good person unfolding in the world, there is this lotus in the great pond of eternity. And as he grows in this world in wisdom and understanding, the lotus opens in the invisible world. And the kind of throne he will sit upon in the infinite is determined by his merits here. The same thought is behind Bailey's mysticism, namely that in some mysterious way, by a process of induction, the heart lotus opens as the result of the growth of soul power. That within man, the entire alchemy of his relationship to eternity is determined by the heart center. And uh, the heart center will accept gladly help of both the mind and the hand. But the heart center is where uh, the 
the actual baptism, the actual mystery of the Pentecostal experience is accorded to the being or the living person. Therefore, the heart center in man represents his spirituality, his essential and real spirituality. And this heart center is where the record or the, or the uh, true and faithful report of his virtues, where this record begins to result in the development or growth of this archetypal soul symbol. This is a little obscure and difficult, but there's not too much you can say about some of these things, because again they can only be known by a sort of mystical experience itself. The field of the heart uh, is called by Bemi a kind of earth. And if the earth be good, then the heart is nourished by that goodness. The seed unfolds and grows. And the mystery of immortality is attained as an experience in the inner consciousness of man himself. The next point that perhaps we can do a little something with is to study a little more carefully this relationship of the heart uh, to the body itself. We can do this by means of an analogy to the solar system. The heart in the body is surrounded by a group of organs. These organs, according to the Babylonians, Chaldeans, Greeks, Romans, practically every civilized people, have always been associated with uh, the planets. Paracelsus makes this very definitely an assertion, namely that the organs surrounding the heart resemble the planets surrounding the sun. Consequently, the organs themselves become secondary deities. They are the secondary powers by means of which the pure life energy of the heart is distributed through the system for a certain purpose. We have three energies with which to consider, each of them, however, being a kind of specialization of basic energy. The pure energy of consciousness forms the mysterious sea of life in which all other forms of consciousness have their existence. This is the pure energy of the sun, which is totally invisible. This is the pure energy of life in all things. And the ultimate of this life is its own eternal, unconditioned fertility. Pythagoras of Samos said that every conceivable unit of life is seminal or seed-like. Therefore, that life is an eternal substance, everywhere existent, like a mysterious invisible ocean or fluid or air, or gas, or essence, that no place can be deficient of it in any way, and that this pure life, which has no form, no appearance that we can see, no nature we can define, no direct processes that we can understand, this pure life alone is good. This pure life is the only reality that exists. This pure life in its unconditioned state is the mysterious intangible fact by which all things exist and without which cannot be fashioned anything that is made. This pure life is absorbed in its own production, so that created things are aware of creation, but they are not aware of the life 
in which creation continually exists. Thus we may see the plant growing from the dark earth, but the dark earth is invisible to us. We may perceive that the plant uh, gains innumerable energies and powers from this dark earth, but this dark earth does not seem to resemble any of its powers. We look at the beautiful rose rising from the earth. We cannot see the rose in the earth. We cannot understand how the dark soil could produce so great a mystery out of itself. Yet it is the energy of the darkness that gave us this beauty of the revealed and apparent form. Thus in philosophy particularly, we recognize that all natures of themselves are sustained by one nature of which we have no definition. This dark soil does not, however, produce identities from itself. This dark soil produces different flowers, different forms of life. It produces everything from the most glorious of all forms uh, to the most humble and even obnoxious of all weeds. This soil, therefore, causes all things to bear their fruitfulness according to their own natures. Yet its energy is the one life by which all natures are able to attain to the condition of living. Therefore, this soil, this earth, this energy, this mystery is the mother of all living. This is the eternal life forever conditioned by which all good and all ill come into being. Yet this life itself is not visibly similar to any of the things which it produces, nor can its nature be determined by a study of its productions. The only thing that we can finally decide is that its nature must be sufficient to sustain all production and that this in no way shall be regarded as exhausting that nature. For it must produce all production within the sensory grasp of man, an innumerable and inevitable production which man does not understand or cannot perceive. So here we have this basic life, this basic uh, vitality which is brought to man as the very substance upon which his life must depend. This life becomes then the vitalizer of innumerable specialized function. And everything that exists must have a sensitized area of some nature must have some means of drawing this life to itself, focusing this life upon itself, inasmuch as the entire growth of the particular life is dependent entirely upon it developing in and from this basic energy. It follows from this that we may liken this energy now to the dark earth, and we may liken uh, the consciousness of a being or a creature to any one of the innumerable plants or forms of life that grow out of this earth, the oak tree and the willow tree, the pine tree and the elm, all have this common source of energy, yet each becomes what it is, but only because this energy is present. So consciousness becomes the universal symbol because it represents the only conceivable power 
which can be all things to all creatures. Every other kind of specialization must be deficient in something. So we give the term consciousness to that which is capable of expression through infinite diversity, and yet itself remains forever the same. That which produces difference from sameness. Now the reason it can do this is because through the vast vistas of consciousness, infinite orders of life are evolving. These evolving orders of life are developing from these seeds, which are spiritual focal areas. And an infinite evolution is continually specializing the units of eternal life itself. So man, being a person, with an intellectual existence, and according to philosophy, with an existence prior to this world, and an existence after or subsequent to departure from this world, man is a personal being with his roots in universal consciousness. He is a personal being nourished by an impersonal principle in which he exists. Now this universal impersonal principle is everywhere. But if the particular aspects of that consciousness are in some way separated from a structure, that structure passes into a state of disintegration. Therefore the integration of the structure depends upon the maintenance of the organization of it in relationship to its life source. If therefore the root of the tree is injured, the whole tree will die. And if the taproot, so to say, of man's existence is injured, then man no longer tunes in or receives the benefit of this universal life in which he exists. He is then like the proverbial sailor on the ocean, surrounded by water and with nothing to drink. This uh, means that if the adjustment between his own structure and this universal energy is not maintained, then he is no longer supplied with this energy, but he becomes a dead thing floating in the very life that supported him. This concept was also rather well brought out by very ancient people. In order that man as a being, as a particular creature unfolding his own composite nature, may therefore have his roots in the life which is essential to him, the heart becomes the instrument of this rooting. It is because of the fact that the heart is capable of receiving and focusing or serving as a channel or medium for the bringing into the body of certain phases of universal energy that man can function as a being just as though it was possible to turn an electric current into a wire and by so doing this wire now becomes suitable to be a telephone. The wires may be there, but if the current is not, nothing happens. The body may be here, but if it's linked to the peculiar universal energy by which it is sustained, if this is missing, then the body is not alive. It has another kind of life. It has a molecular life, but it does not have the kind of life that we know. And as man as a being cannot exist consciously in a body contrary to his own inward adjustment, man cannot inhabit the body if life as a principle departs from it. I think then we have to recognize two persons in our problem. One is this universal person who supplies energy or which is energy 
and the other is the individual person who is evolving uh, as the plant or any other creature in nature evolves because of the abundant supply of energy to make this evolution possible. Thus, we may definitely affirm that the heart does have two distinct functions, one represented by its core function and the other by its peripheral function. Its core and essential function being to serve as the intermediary or a catalyzing agent between space and manifestation. And the other is that it shall serve as a kind of throne for what we term the ego or the consciousness of the evolving being that has moved into this environment. In other words, in the heart must also be the archetype of the form that is to develop from the heart, not only in terms of physical appearance, but in terms of mental, emotional, and psychical existence. Thus it would appear that uh, Bailey is not entirely incorrect when he declared that the spirit in man, the personal spirit, which is himself, abides within the heart, that this is its holy house. And in this place, the spirit itself worships at the altar of the Most High God, the Most High God being the mysterious power which is greater than itself, which is the life principle upon which it subsists. From this spirit core of individual existence, the essential state or nature of the being that is now incarnating begins the unfoldment of its own character, a process which begins at the time of quickening, a time in which the personal being, the entity, takes over the administration of the body and then begins the process of adapting the entire mystery provided by universal life to the needs of the personal existence. Man can control a very large part of his own function, but if the exception of a few very highly specialized individuals, man cannot consciously control the beat of his own heart. If man uh, had, had this as a voluntary function with his present state of evolution, he would probably forget it one of these days and drop dead. But as a result of the fact that he cannot do this, we have another symbolic situation, namely that the fact of life itself is not directly available to man, that this fact is imparted by something superior that the beating of the heart or the maintenance of the relationship between uh, energy and uh, the function of the body is not primarily under the keeping of man himself. Man may destroy the instrument or by a very long process of deterioration wreck the instrument. He may, by intensities of his attitudes, so condition it that it can no longer function properly. But all that man can do to the, to the pulse beat is interfere with it. He has no power to cause it. It began when he was not conscious of his own existence. It continues frequently long after he loses consciousness of his own existence. Or it may stop suddenly. But in any event, it is not something that man himself can control. It is the one link between himself and the infinite, in which the infinite still holds all the cards, which is probably highly suitable because man is not capable of, as, uh, of 
handling this situation at his present state of growth. So every part of man's life, according to the old mystics, is under the sovereignty of his will, except the pulse. The pulse point in the heart is subject only to the motion of the infinite. Consequently, man has a continual uh, a promise, a pact, or contract with the infinite, represented by the pulse beat. This is like the rainbow that appeared to Noah. It is a covenant between the infinite and man. For as long as the pulse beats, the infinite is with man. And when man, by some reason or other, separates himself from the infinite, the pulse ceases. Now, the principal cause, of course, of this separation is the gradual exhaustion of the structure of the body and its ability to continue uh, to respond to this sensitive beat. Gradually, situations set in in which the individual by age and so forth, uh, loses the power to control the functions of the body. And when the crystallization or the general deterioration reaches the point in which the pulse can no longer respond to the beat, the individual ceases to exist physically, not as a being but as a body. So man now finds himself standing forever in the presence of a mystery, a mystery as great as that which he faces when he gazes out on a starry sky at night. He is suddenly in the midst of a vastness, and all this vastness that is not his own personal self is brought into rapport with him, and he partakes of this vastness because of the heartbeat. This is his true relationship with the infinite. Most mystics have sensed this and realized it, and have therefore turned to this mysterious altar of the heart, on which burns the mysterious flame of everlastingness. It has become one of the greatest of all symbols of the infinite because it is in this symbolism that man sees the ever-presence of his God. And any man who is able to be still will know, because if we are very quiet, we can hear the beating of the drum of life. The old peoples all held this conviction. Out of this supply we gain, therefore, a sense of nutrition also. For as the body is sustained outwardly by its, petition, uh, by its participation in the great nutritional areas of human maintenance, the energy of things, so nutrition is inwardly provided by this mysterious pulse beat. But the nutrition we take in has no direct effect upon the pulse beat. The only thing it affects is the physical structure, which if it is starved or inadequately fed, can no longer react to the beat of the heart. Or if by impoverishment of nutrition the heart muscle is impoverished to a certain degree, then it may not be able to respond and the person dies. But the nutrition does not support the heartbeat. The nutrition only makes possible the maintenance of the body so that the beating of the heart may be a normal and proper function. So man has his own personality to consider, and behind that personality this X quantity, this mystery from which he can never escape while he is here. This energy also uh, provides him with the means of unfolding the temperament which he has. 
This energy, becoming specialized, uh, supports all of the processes of his growth and attainment. In its various aspects, it becomes mental energy and physical energy. It provides the necessary psychic communion by which the entire personality is bound into one being. This one being, however, is a magnificent superstructure built over a tiny little pulse beat by which its ex existence and survival is measured. Everything that is dependent is less than that upon which it depends. This was an ancient oracle of wisdom. Man is completely dependent on the pulse. Therefore, the pulse must represent a link between man and something infinitely greater than man, and an infinite relationship to all beings. Uh, this pulse beat the ancients sensed or believed that they saw in the mysterious flickering of the stars. It was a symbol of this universal agitation or vibration everywhere present in nature. Once the heart situation then uh, receives its understanding, we can perhaps liken it even more to a temple and to a shrine. We can liken it to Solomon's everlasting house or to one of the mysterious shrines in Asia, such as the beautiful uh, temples of the Dilwara, of the Jain sect, or the wonderful mysterious cave temples of Hyderabad, or on the island of Elephanta, or the temple of heaven in Peking, or one of the great mosques of, of, of the Muslim world, such as the Jumna Masjid at Delhi in India. All of these buildings become now symbols of the heart, for to them men turn to commune with a spirit, a power. In ancient times this power was in the form of a flame, guarded forever upon an altar in the aditam of the temple. This flame was guarded by the priests and vestals, and was never permitted to go out, for it was the symbol of the eternal covenant between God and man. The flame itself flickered like the pulse. It was a mysterious livingness. Fire was an element that seemed as mysterious as life itself, and was anciently identified with life. The person becomes the high priest of this sanctuary, and man as a being, as an ego, as a personality, an individuality, was anciently regarded as being permitted by purification and by rites of regeneration and repentance to finally enter into the sanctum of the temple, and there to bow before the mystery of the eternal flame, which is the pulse. And in this he prayed, or became uh, possessed by the spirit of a great veneration, and this became the very process of mystical enlightenment. And in every part of the world it was assumed that the mystic, seeking truth, always sought it by entering into his own heart. This was his secret house. This was his temple, his shrine, his palace. This was the place where God came and dwelt with men. And the uh, sanctification of a temple, and the rite still used in the uh, sanctifying of a church are based upon all these ancient convictions. Once having come into the living mystery of this, it was assumed that the heart then became the basis of a mysterious 
direction of the septenary of man's psycho-emotional life. In other words, the heart, having been established as the sanctuary, the individual then, having dedicated this sanctuary to the one living God, setting it aside as a holy place unto the Most High, then proceeded to go forth as the initiate or adept being in the service of this consciousness and in the glorification of it. In the mysteries of the Holy Grail, uh, this mysterious heart symbol was the Sun Grail, which also, of course, in some of the older legends, was the Sun Grail Real, the mysterious cup that carried the blood of the king. This strange symbolism also, the symbol of the precious blood, the, pr the symbol of the cleansing blood, all had to do with the purification of the body by the blood moving into the presence of the life, where it received an ordination of life, where it passed through this tremendous vibratory focus of universal life and impregnated with it, went forth again to the works of life, namely the ministry, which was the distribution of energy through the bloodstream. The heart was therefore the one the one sacred symbol, the symbol of the entire integration of the universe around a spiritual principle. This principle being known particularly as the heart power. Now ancient man became more or less uh, of the understanding that the heart power represented a kind of divine fact. Akhenaten, the great Egyptian mystic, seems to have sensed this long before most other civilized human beings had attained to this concept. <coughs> Namely, that this mysterious heart power, the life, the true life, was of itself life-giving, but that man was life-destroying. That this life, therefore, came forth, having been born in a manger, and this again is only a symbol of the heart itself, because in the ancient times the inn, or the place of rest, was also called the heart. This symbol was to the effect that man by deviating from the laws of this heart principle, gradually destroyed his religion. He had to perform a sacrilegious act, and the sacrilegious act, the final unforgivable sin, that ill which could never be forgiven, was the sin of letting the fire go out, death. And this fire had to go out for some reason. Now this does not mean that the ancient immediately conceived physical immortality. He knew the true meaning of sin, which is not evil, but to fall short, inadequacy. But he did realize that when the individual in any way perverted the power of this energy, so that it turned and became an enemy of itself. He was committing a very great and terrible sacrilegious act. So Akhenaten gave us this realization that those who have become aware of the matchless altar of the heart and who have stood or knelt in the presence of the flame have become its servants and therefore that they must gradually bring the entire unit of life existence into harmony with the laws of the flame. For this flame will either illumine or it will consume. And this mysterious heat power of the pulse will either bring light or combustion. 
according to the nature of the material which serves as its fuel or serves as its focal substance in this world. Thus this light a life is forever burning out or removing corruption. The uh, mystics held, therefore, that those who believed in the ultimate universal reality of life were required to so live and so conduct themselves that this flame in the heart was protected and preserved against anything that was bad for it. And anything that was bad for it would ultimately break up the focal point and cause the fire to go out. They also realized that anything that was bad for the flame or hazarded the flame in the heart was also contrary to the good of the evolving person or entity which was depending upon this heart and was the priest of its altar. So anything that injured the heart fly, flame was bad for the evolving entity that was depending upon this energy for its own evolution. To preserve its relationship to life, this entity must preserve its relationship to value. And out of this came perhaps one of the earliest concepts of ethics. Eth ethics was not based upon right and wrong in the terms of ordinary human concept. Ethics might be, a f might be measured by a final circumstance. Did it cause the flame to go out? Anything that destroyed the contact willfully and intent intentionally or deprived the individual of full participation in this vital life principle was bad. That was the actual source of the concept of evil. And anything that was bad for the life was bad for the person in the body. Gradually, therefore, man sought through purification, through regeneration, uh, through idealization, uh, to live a more beautiful and perfect life in order that this energy in its function might attain a maximum diffusion. And by this maximum diffusion, would provide the best of the qualities of energy for all purposes of the evolving being. If this confusion persisted, then the energy necessary to think or to feel or to act or to perform any sensory function or any process or task, the energy was diminished. And it was discovered in early times that any evil that man performs struck directly at the heart and that therefore it affected the pulse point or the pulse beat, the pacemaker. And wherever this occurred, it meant that man was interfering with his own participation in universal life. He was, in a sense, also discrediting or desecrating this life which must come into manifestation through the vehicles created by evolving beings. It's a little complicated, but here we have the secret of the Eucharist. Here we also have the secret of the Last Supper. We have the secret of the Eucharistic rites among non-Christian peoples. For here we have the participation by the whole nature represented for the twelve, for they constitute the zodiacal band or the hypothetical uh, dodecahedron of Pythagoras, which constituted the full structure of the universe or the total nature of any being, was twelve. Therefore, in this case, the disciples, uh, partaking of the bread and the wine, are partaking of the basic life power. And when they destroy or permit to be destroyed the high priest of this mystery, they destroy their own participation in this life power. They betray it. 
and if they betray it, it is taken from them. So in the mystical orders of the quest, the great orders of chivalry in the Middle Ages, the heart doctrine became the symbol of virtue. For virtue ha has as its final end quietude, and quietude means the free power of the pulse beat to maintain its rhythms and to function ever more perfectly, because the heart muscle is not made toxic by the psychic and psychological pressures of the individual. Thus the cleanliness of mind and body, and, uh, exemplified in the ancient rituals, guaranteed the maximum manifestation of the eternal in man. Now the uh, ancients philosophized on this quite extensively. They pointed out that the heart dweller, by which they meant essentially now this energy, was never a moralizer in itself. It never told anybody what to do. But it revealed that if they did certain things, it hurt. There is no dogmatism. There is simply law and the breaking of law. Not by covenant or code as we understand it, or by legislation, but simply by the fact that there, there are rules in space governing the distribution of energy. If these rules are broken, the energy fails the individual who breaks the rules, because he has primarily failed the energy. All of this centers in the heart concept. And it was gradually recognized that the heart, under certain conditions, uh, could also become a more joyous, a more ample and suitable uh, place. Just as from the first rude stone monuments and runic pillars of old time, there have gradually developed the beautiful churches and chapels that we know today. Men's places of worship were once rude altars in the wilderness. Today they are magnificent in appearance, if only the true inner mystery of them could be more fully understood. But the heart becoming this nobler mansion that we are continuously building, we know that by certain definite processes, we may bring greater vibratory adjustment to the heart. We know that every cell in the body changes gradually over a period of years, that new orders of life come into being in our bodies every few minutes. If, therefore, through certain processes uh, constructively and devoutly adhered to, through these processes, the heart is strengthened. The heart structure is refined and improved by intent rather than by the simple processes of growth. And nearly all the processes which make for the happiness of the heart are processes of kindliness, friendliness, charity, and goodness. That with these faculties, the, with these factors, the heart itself relaxes and becomes peaceful and becomes instinctively more immediately responsive to this pulse beat that is constantly continuing there. Now let us assume for a moment that we have followed this line of thought. We have seen the Great, the invisible power represented by the altar with the flame. We have seen the hierophant of this mystery, the human ego, the high priest of this mystery cult, man as a being focused in the temple of his heart. We know that man only under certain conditions is permitted to enter into the presence of the Most High these conditions being those of disciplined meditation and the most highly evolved specialized doctrines of the wisdom religion. Also we realize that the time naturally comes when, as the Moslem says, 
each man must unwind his own shroud. Here, of course, you all remember the Muslim wears a white cloth twisted around his head called a turban. This is his shroud. He wears it all his life, and he will be wrapped in it when he dies. So as one Muslim mystic says in one of his stories, he knew his time was coming because his heart was whispering goodbye. It was a very uh, poetic thought, but this is the, the concept underlying it all. The time comes when the body is no longer suitable to maintain the needs of the being. The being is not yet wise enough and strong enough to preserve this body. Someday, perhaps it can do so for an indefinite period of time, but the whole way of life will have to change. So the time comes when the pulse archetype tells us that energy is going to move away. Psychologically, we seem to be aware of this. And here again, the direct awareness seems to arise from the actual agitation of the pulse itself, long before it actually ceases. Man becomes some way mysteriously aware that the transition is to occur. He hears the voice saying farewell. In this time, finally, the energy fields, gradually depleted, are no longer able to sustain the being that is now dwelling in this vitalized area. So the being, possessing its faculties and its septenaries of powers, then begins to draw in to itself as the ego or personal integration center, draw in all of its sub-department heads, its managers and its clerks and its superintendents and even a few uh, office boys which are vast vanishing. They are now called vice presidents. And in this situation, uh, the heart gradually gathers into itself all of these elements until finally they have come to be one unit and the ego has uh, enfolded back into itself again. In a sense, this lotus flower of the entity has closed uh, mysteriously like the lotus itself closes at night in the darkness of death. By this time, the pattern is becoming very definite within the nature. It has become obvious that this separation must take place. Then the process uh, begins, which in a uh, simple physiological way is simply this retiral up the mysterious left branch of the vagus, in which having finally gathered its own powers, the ego, the incarnating being, moves out because it has found that it can no longer function adequately. It can no longer be itself, so it must depart, as Socrates himself predicted. So it goes up through the vagus, finally enters the great central hall of the brain, where incidentally the judgment of the soul takes place in the great mysterious twin uh, pillared hall of truth. And finally, it uh, sends through the thousand petal lotus, the Brahmarandra, and goes out through the crown of the head and returns to the decarnate state which it previously occupied. In other words, it retires from objectivity to subjectivity. This does not necessarily mean, however, that the old energy, the pulse maker, has ceased. This universal life may still be there. And we know many instances, and we constantly come across them, where a person is medically and scientifically alive, but unable to function, unable to even be conscious, but may drift along for a little while in a state of deep coma. In this case, where once the separation has been made, 
Even the physician says it is only a matter of hours, a matter of minutes. We do not know. But still the heart is beating. But the heart is beating against an ever-losing game. But it very often happens that the heart continues to beat for a time after the entity has actually departed. I believe originally this was probably intended. But in the course of ages, the situation has become so complicated by artificial circumstances that nature's essential pattern is now difficult to discern. I think nature intended the heart to continue to beat until certain psychological experiences had been accomplished by the entity in disassociation. But now that is not always the case. But in any event, theoretically, the heart slowly flutters down and the altar flame on the heart goes out. When this happens, then it simply means that this bridge or link has ceased to function and the infinite life simply goes on, waiting for the day, of course, when the bud again will appear upon the surface of the waters. But it is a very uh, quiet procedure. That which remains then is the body which will slowly vanish or disintegrate into its natural substances and this great sea of existence which goes on. Now the life which animated has not changed. The thing that was animated is going back again into the subtle substances of being to be resolved into innumerable forms when other potters take the clay. Nothing has essentially changed. Time and eternity remain. But it is this mysterious life that continues unchanged due to, uh, regardless of the changes of form and circumstance that Buddha used as the final symbol of his nirvana. His nirvana was this life itself this eternal allness to which everything must turn, upon which everything must depend, the mysterious real axis of the wheel of illusion. So that finally there is only this life principle animating all things, bestowing upon them the mystery of their own existence, ultimately solving their existence back into itself again and remaining in the end the only thing that is. This is the existence in itself and the altar of the heart is its manifestation in man, a manifestation of which it may be truly said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. The Lord brings the flame, the Lord takes the flame. And we can slur it a little and say, law for Lord. And we shall have the same essential principle. That this is the power that the infinite bestows of its own infiniteness, and which it returns again to itself by its own means. A man's heart stands as the symbol of this before the world of generations in which he exists. Time's up. Thank <laughs> you.